Hello everybody, Dr. Anthony Cave, your Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist here to talk about a really important story that comes up almost every week with my patients. Whether I'm calling them the night before a scary time like surgery, or they're about to have their ketamine infusion with me for their mental health, or they're just concerned about pain in my clinic, and they, I explain what we're gonna do, and I ask them if they have any more questions. And they say, nope, no more questions, I'm good. But I look in their eyes, and I'm like, are you sure? I get the sense that something is still bothering you. Are you sure you don't have any questions? And then, boom, it all comes out. I'm not saying this in a like, negative way or a mean way, I'm just being honest that there's many times that, as a patient, we might feel uncomfortable, we might be afraid of asking an embarrassing question, of being gaslit, of being abandoned, especially in vulnerable times, like before chemo, before surgery. If you've, if you've been suffering with chronic pain, you've already experienced so much negativity from the medical world sometimes that you might not want to ask those questions, even if you really want to, and yeah, they're important for your health. So how can you talk to your doctors in a way that helps you better connect with them so that you can ask the difficult questions without feeling uncomfortable or embarrassed or too shy to be able to advocate for yourself so that you can have a better health outcome? Because nobody else in the world, nobody else even in this operating room that we're in right now will ever be a bigger advocate for your health than yourself. No matter how many loved ones you have, you need to feel empowered to speak up for yourself, to ask the right questions, to get the knowledge that you need to help you prepare for whatever procedure or treatment you're looking at. Right? I don't want to be cliche here, but knowledge really is power, like Einstein said, but nowhere is that more so the case than before a scary, a big procedure like surgery. So the first point is that when you're asking a question to the doctor, you want to make sure that this question is for your gain. And I mean that because how you ask the question shapes whether that answer is going to be helpful for you and where you're coming at the question from. Bottom line, curiosity, as I've talked about before, remember that there's two types, an I type and a D type that we're going to talk about. The other thing is the question of bridges versus destinations. And whenever a patient's asking me a question, and if they're really in with their medical care, they'll know exactly what to ask, and they'll know what, <laughs> how to get the doctor's ears to perk. And that's by asking the hard question, bridge versus therapy. Because nearly every patient that I see, especially those with chronic pain, either Danlos, autoimmune conditions, they're stuck, they're stuck with these destination therapies. We'll talk about that too, but first is curiosity. Why is curiosity so important before you even get to the bridge versus destination? Curiosity is because it shapes how we're gonna frame the answer that we receive. When you get, um, when you have a question that you're curious about, if it's from a place of genuine interest, we call that eye type. It doesn't matter what the answer is. It depends on the journey that you're on to reach that question. So it's really, really different than the D type of curiosity. It's called deprivation, what I sometimes call destructive curiosity, where you need to figure out an answer and you won't be able to be settled or relaxed until you figure out the answer to that question. This can have potentially disastrous consequences if it becomes an addiction for us and we can't break free of it. For example, imagine uh, you want to figure out, it's like you see an actor on TV, you're like, who was that actor? You can't be relaxed until you're, you figure out who the actor is, their name. You can't settle to be at a place of peace, etc. Now, well, what if it's someone before surgery? They come in this room and their mindset is like, I'm not going to be at peace until this is over, until I know exactly what's happened to my body, and I we can't stop thinking about it until it's over. Well, this is clearly a lot of cognitive rigidity, which by the way, I see all the time with patients, even when they're on the operating room table there. By the way, that's, uh, yeah, ignore the breathing tube and the mask. That's the regular OR table. But the point is that this is, there's what we call uncertain, or pardon, intolerance of ambiguity. This can torpedo our, health, our healing efforts. Intolerance of uncertainty, intolerance of ambiguity are really powerful 
uh, when we recognize them so that we can avoid them. Darian, good to see you. Um, and so Sheila, I'm happy to hear that your cataract surgery went well. <laughs> so the point here, the takeaway, is that when you're asking a question, is it coming from a place where you need to know the answer and it's gonna eat you up from the inside until you get the answer? Or is it coming from a place of interest, I type curiosity, interest, inspiration, where you're okay if you don't get the exact answer you want, but you're genuinely curious. You wanna know what your doctor has to say about it. Not the nitpicky necessarily of what or how they're saying it, but what are they saying? Where are they coming from? What is it that they're gonna impart? What kind of knowledge are they gonna give me so I can be a better advocate for myself? If you frame your questions that way, you will probably be much happier getting the answer and your doctor is gonna be more willing to talk with you about it. So let's go into the, this now segues into this whole concept of bridge versus destination therapies and how if you ask about them from a place of genuine interest, you're probably going to get a more satisfying answer and one that gives you more knowledge to advocate for yourself. Um, hey, Chrissy, I'm sorry that you've had COVID and um, you're struggling to sleep, but I hope that you gain some knowledge from what we're talking about so you can take your health care so you can be a better advocate for your own health. I hope that you feel better and that your insomnia gets better as well. Um, and Jessica, good to see you. I agree, increased isolation has caused you along with many others to have this intolerance of uncertainty. You're so correct. Um, very good to see you. Uh, all right. So Courtney is saying, how do we make sure doctors listen to our concerns? So when you ask from this place of curiosity, they're going to answer in a way that's different. So bridge versus destination. A bridge therapy. Let's say someone's coming to me for a ketamine infusion. And they're like, doc, um, my back pain is killing me. I can't get up out of bed in the morning. It's making me depressed. It's this cycle, right? Pain, depression, and then you can't move around because you can't get out of bed. So your depression gets worse. The pain gets worse because you can't move. It's a cycle. So, Doc, what are my options? What are the side effects? How will they interact with the medications I'm taking? What are the alternatives to the standard pain meds that everyone gets? Boom, that's a question of curiosity of genuine interest. That's not just like, tell me the answer, Doc. I need to do something to get my back better. That would be curiosity of a deprivational type. I'm not saying it's not a legit question. It's clearly very important, but you see how the mindset is drastically different? So my response <laughs> is bridge versus destination. If I am giving them a therapy that I'm expecting them to be on for the rest of their life, we call that a destination therapy. These are dangerous because that means there's no other options. Whenever a doctor is telling you something that you're like, wait a minute, you're telling me to take this medication for the rest of my life. How am I ever going to get off of this? Well, that sounds like a destination therapy. So for example, you have high cholesterol and lifestyle modification isn't working. Your doctor puts you on a statin. Might be very well appropriate. Statins have a role. They're life-saving in the right circumstances, right? But you're going to be on that statin for the rest of your life. That's a destination. Let's compare that to something like you come to me with an infection, like a pneumonia. Uh, if it's really bad, you may need to be hospitalized and get IV antibiotics. But that's not the destination, that's the bridge. The IV antibiotics get the bacterial load low enough so that your immune system can then take over. So that's a bridge to your body being able to heal itself. In the case of back pain, I could give you opioids and say, take these for the rest of your life. That wouldn't solve the problem. I could give you Prozac for the rest of your life wouldn't solve the problem. That would be a destination in the form of a band-aid. But if it was a matter of, let's say, for example, there was a pinched nerve that needed a laminectomy or maybe some surgery or some procedure to relieve the bony impingement, well then that surgery would be a bridge to you being able to heal yourself after the surgery and not live with that back pain. For example, right? There's many, many examples here, right? Maybe it's having enough NSAIDs like Advil so that you can go to physical therapy to re-strengthen muscles and that will tap into your inner healing potential. So the NSAIDs like the Tylenol or Advil, or not the Tylenol, pardon, the Advil <laughs> or naproxen or whatever become a bridge to your body healing itself. I hope that clarifies. And if a doctor gives you an answer and you're like, you know, doc, you're thinking to yourself, you may not verbalize this because you don't want to sound embarrassed. You're like, well, doc, I uh, 
you're thinking, you know, Doc, how is this going to get me better? I don't want to be taking Norco for the rest of my life. I don't want to be taking Meloxicam for the rest of my life. I want to be able to live without medications. Is it a bridge or a destination? The doctor has the obligation. A, well, you know, a doctor who's trained needs to be figuring out how can you be on bridges, not on destination therapies, whenever safely possible. But you'll get the, the cox of turn. You'll have your doctor recognize that they're working with someone who's very motivated to heal themselves. That's how they'll open up and he, how you can have that discussion so that they'll listen to you, hopefully, and they'll be able to give you the care that you need because they recognize your values. Your values aren't here for band-aids. Your values are you want your body to heal itself with whatever support the doctor can prescribe for you to get there. So with that said, I wanted to answer your questions and you guys can give me examples of the hardest questions you've wanted to ask a quite, uh, your doctor and maybe how I can help you frame them because you might learn from each other's examples. That being said, if you appreciate me coming on here at the end of a long day in surgery, I'd appreciate it if you hit that like button and leave a comment, share what you learned with others, <laughs> you know, all that good stuff. So that being said, the hardest surgery I've ever done, well, um, well, by far is when you have a septic patient coming in for an emergency surgery. I mean, that's, or a cardiac surgery like a busted valve or an aortic aneurysm or a dissection. Those are some of the hardest surgeries by far. Um, Lauren says, I have CRPS, great doctor, but still get nervous from previous doctors. Um, okay. Sorry, <laughs> Lauren is, is trying to heal from CRPS. Uh, Lauren, is there a particular question you've wanted to ask your doctor? Maybe the past doctors conditioned you to feel like you're asking for too much that you're being a pushy or demanding patient. I hope you never felt that way, but many patients come to me very apprehensive about asking me questions. And it's like, no, you can be open with me. I want to hear your concerns because the more proactive you are with me, the better I can know what's important to you to help you achieve those goals. So please, if other doctors have made you feel uneasy, don't let that inhibit your growth. Tori says that she has to get surgery at 7 a.m. Tori, I'm wishing you the best for your surgery. I hope everyone here sends you positive vibes as well. Um, Breeb, uh, Breebrot has been in the ER, scared and super anxious. Oh, thank you for uh, supporting Tori there. Man, I love this community. You guys are so helpful to each other. Shalone says, is it bad to be put under often and in a short period of time? Shalone, good or bad at being here in an operating room on this table under anesthesia connected to the monitors here. It's not that it's good or bad. It's that, is this safer than the alternative? If the alternative is you um, not surviving, not being alive in 24 hours, well, this is much safer than that alternative, right? It's all about risks. You know, this is doctor lingo. We call it RBA, risks, benefits, and alternatives. It's all about the RBA, not about the absolute. Good question. Uh, you have to tell your surgeon if you have stomach issues if you're going under surgery. Yes, Dr. Quinn, please tell your anesthesiologist. What happens when you're back? Oh, when they fuse? Okay, so Alaska and girl is asking about broken hardware in the back. What happens is they often have to go back in to remove the broken hardware or to repair it in another way. I'm sorry that you've experienced that, Alaskan girl. Tracy says, Doc, I'm stuck in that pain depression cycle. It's absolutely horrible. Tracy Parks, um, your name looks very familiar. Interesting. Uh, huh. I, think I, I think we've communicated before, Tracy. But pain and depression, the problem is that, I hope everyone here, if you know anyone who's been suffering with pain and depression, please tell them this. This is really important. Depression, if untreated, can make pain worse because emotional pain and physical pain are connected. I'm not gaslighting. It's reality. This is truth. You can't treat physical pain if you have emotional pain. Emotional pain comes in the form of anxiety, of drug seeking or seeking anything, addiction, depression. These all accentuate physical pain. And physical pain will accentuate emotional pain or psychological pain. No questions asked. They're both very real. You can't treat one without the other. You cannot treat one without the other. And undertreated chronic pain can lead to psychological disorders, uh, mental health conditions. And untreated mental health conditions can lead to serious physical problems like worse pain, but also heart attacks, early onset dementia. You know, we don't have any medications in the West for early onset dementia. 
<laughs> we don't have any ways of regrowing heart cells. So there is imperative. It is so important that we recognize that our pains are connected. You can't treat one without treating the other. That's why, um, and not to make a plug here for ketamine, but like in the right context, the patients that come to me for my ketamine infusions, we can address both of them, right? With that caring environment, compassionate mindset, the doctor is listening. And this is what you can do when you find that healer that you really connect with and that recognizes that the only silver bullet in medicine is really gonna be your healing potential. Some exceptions, but for the most part, no medication on its own will be that silver bullet as much as you can be for yourself. Um, PC Alvis Santana, I'm really happy that you made it onto your first live ever. <laughs> um, all right, do I have cool socks? Asks Darian. I do have cool socks, and maybe I'll show them to you at the end. Cheryl. Uh, or, Cheryl says, when someone has had back surgery and they roll the table over and you're facing the floor, how do you monitor patients? Um, I, don't have, I don't have it in this room. We put your face in what's called a prone hole. It's like this massage pillow that we put your face in. We put all the same monitors on you, whether it's an arterial line here, um, blood pressure cuff. We just put them on different parts of your body. If you see my other videos, I actually show what that looks like, so you should check them out. Sarah Cyphers has anxiety. I'm sorry, Sarah, but I hope that you recognize that anxiety often has, it can be treated. So many of my patients with anxiety can come off of their medications, whether it's an SSRI or SNRI, but you need to have the healer who's willing to take you through that journey to get off of them. And it's never a failure to be on those medications. It's a failure to not explore other options to treat your anxiety. Savannah says, talk with your anesthesiologist. Yes, I agree, Savannah. Um, uh, Tori is gonna stay up all night to fall asleep faster. So Tori is getting to the point that the more tired you are, when you come to the operating room with me on this table, you need less anesthesia gas. So that's less of this stuff here. This sevoflurane and the desflurane. The more Oops, I ripped out my microphone. I ripped out my microphone. Sorry, my microphone got ripped out of the phone. I don't know if you saw that, but yeah, the more tired you are, the less anesthesia you need. That's right, Tori. Um, Lauren says, other treatments, ketamine. I'm, it's stigma. I don't follow what you're saying, Lauren. Uh, I'm not following Lauren. <laughs> ketamine can be very powerful. There are stigmas against it, like any medication, but there's a time and a place for medications like ketamine to address the root causes of emotional and physical pain. Courtney says, how would I ask my doctor? Oh, Courtney, what was your question? What was your, oh, guys, Courtney is asking, I have epilepsy. I wanna know how long I have to be seizure free before trying to come off meds. I was off meds before. Wow, Courtney, I'm, thank you for your vulnerability in sharing that. And epilepsy is very, very tough. My heart goes out to you. As, for those of you who don't know, if you have epilepsy, you can't do a lot of the normal things that you and I take for granted, like driving a car. Uh, if you're into aviation, you can't be a pilot. You can't do a lot of things when you have epilepsy. Now, coming off of meds for epilepsy is a little bit tough, Courtney, because um, <laughs> you might not be able to go back to doing what you're ordinarily doing if you don't have those meds on board to keep, your, keep yourself seizure-free. So without knowing any more about your circumstance, what I would say to my doctor is, I would say, once again, a place of curiosity. Doctor, in your experience, have you had patients come off of their seizure medications and be able to live their lives like they did before they had seizures? You're not being confrontational. It's genuine interest. And you're asking about their experience because you as an individual, Courtney, there's no other Courtney out there in the world like you. So, Yes, there's a bank of data for the average patient, but you want to know this doctor who you're trusting your health with, have they ever had an experience with a Courtney like yourself? How can they help guide you? You're curious. Doctor, in your experience, you're the expert. What have you seen that might be relevant to my case? Because you can tell I want to get off of my seizure medications. In that one question frame that way, they can tell your values, what you're trying to accomplish. It's very hard to blow off a question like that, I got to say. Very, very hard. Um, so healthy, uh, Chris is saying, 
for asking for pain medication. So Chris, I just finished filming a video on how to ask for pain meds, uh, <laughs> but I'll give you the TLDR. It's that doctors have been played for a long time because really genuine, really nice, really good patients have ended up dying because of medications that we prescribed. And that's the worst phone call for a doctor to get. The worst phone calls when someone calls the office and they say, you know what, patient X was found dead in their apartment and they were your patient, you were prescribing the Norco, or you were prescribing the Moxie, or whatever. I'm not saying it's you, obviously, Chris, but you know, there's a lot of fear amongst pay, uh, physicians, a lot of fear, because that can ruin your career. You can be jaded for the rest of your life. When the best intention patient, who you never thought was diverting or abusing, right? So it's a complicated question, but it, the video goes into, the, the, into how to, bridge that gap, no pun intended with bridge. But how do you get yourself to speak, how do you get your doctor, pardon, to speak with you about what are the other treatments that can be bridges and not destinations? Because I gotta say, being on pain meds for the rest of your life is not a good destination unless it's treatment for cancer or a terminal illness, that's a different story. That's not what we're talking about. It's not what the average patient is coming to me with. And I certainly appreciate that. Great questions. Prospection is saying, can you request a video of falling asleep and waking up? It's very, very rare. I've never done that for a patient because usually there's rules to not having um, cameras during patient care in operating rooms. Here, right now, there's no patient in the room, so that's why I'm doing it. But it's very rare to do that otherwise. Mushrooms for dementia. No, no evidence for that. Uh, if you want to talk about microdosing, there might be something there, but very, very uh, minimal evidence. Um, Pickle says, how do you talk to your doctor about procedure, diagnosis, treatment when they brush you off multiple times to just trust them or just take medication? Pickles, I'm with you 100%. And that's why there's a rule for, I don't want to say doctor shopping, but I do want to say for trying to find the right fit with your doctor. Just like when I'm recommending one of my patients to find a therapist, I recommend a handful of therapists. And I say, I'm not going to be offended if you don't like my therapists. But you need to have someone that you trust. If you don't trust the person that is supposed to help you heal, how can you ever let them help you? How can they ever know who you are if you don't trust them? You know, it's this bi-directional relationship. Sometimes I recognize you can't pick your doctor because realistically there's a shortage of doctors. And that's where um, it's tough to say, but put in a request to, see, to, to be in, the, well, not in line for another doctor if possible. It's not out of disrespect. I don't take disrespect when a patient doesn't want me to be their doctor. I recognize that there's many things that go in to that, that fit and feel in a relationship, especially a healing one. And if anyone is taking offense at that, it's reasonable for them to ask why. And I've asked patients, I said, hey, why did you want another doctor? What was it that you felt I wasn't able to meet you on so that I can be a better doctor for future patients and that so the patient can be honest with themselves and with their selves but what they really want out of that doctor relationship. If you find yourself unable to trust the doctor because of the pill pushing, I think it's always best to be honest with your doctor and say, doctor, I don't think that's the right therapy for me because maybe I don't want to be on that pill for the rest of my life. Maybe that pill gave me side effects. It's not worth me having my A1C lower if I'm going to feel horrible all the time. Can we explore other treatment methods? Because I really don't feel well on that medication. It's not attacking, it's about saying how you feel. Because our job at the end of the day, Pickles, is for you to feel good about yourself and be healthy along the way. Not just pushing pills to make numbers like an A1C or a blood pressure look good on a monitor. Um, hey from New Hampshire, Megan. Hey back from the San Francisco Bay Area. Did I have any funny patients today, Darian asks. I had... Uh, I don't think I had any funny patients per se, but there are a lot of great patients today. A lot of anxious patients. Uh, house of hotness. <laughs> Again, the doctor couldn't help me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to laugh at this comment. The doctor couldn't help my late husband with cancer. What can we do to get help with any kind of cancer? My husband passed away recently. House of hotness. I'm really sorry to hear that. Not knowing anything else about your specific circumstances, it's very difficult to say. But recognizing that there are some cancers that cannot be treated and the role for hospice, the role for palliative care, 
is very, is very powerful. Now, I, I don't know what the circumstances were, but I can say that if a doctor, uh, this is a tough subject to address in 30 seconds, except to say that asking for palliative services, even if you don't think you're going to need them up front, is not, uh, there should be no stigma for that. I know it feels bad to do that from a patient perspective, but empowering yourself with that knowledge and that perspective can only be helpful for you. I'm sorry about your loss and I hope everyone here um, expresses their condolences as well. The, dis the, the decisive connection. Dr. Kave, can you share with me the steps you go through when waking a patient up from surgery? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, when someone's waking up from surgery, there are many ways of doing it. You can pull out the breathing tube when they're still fully asleep, but you may not be able to do that if they can't breathe on their own, like they have sleep apnea, or maybe they have bad acid reflux and they might aspirate. So I, usually, I rarely do that. I usually wait for them to wake up. I give them positive affirmations along the way. Like uh, literally, and it looks silly. People make fun of me for this, but I go down to their ear level. I literally go down to their ear level here on this table and I explain to them that the surgery went well. Their surgeon, Dr. So-and-so, did a good job with your surgery. It's over. You didn't lose much blood. It's time to wake up. When you're ready, open your eyes, squeeze my hand, whatever it is that I want them to do based on their anesthesia, their surgery. Time to wake up. When you're ready, open up your eyes. Squeeze my hand, open your mouth. And we'll pull out the breathing tube that way so that if there is some awareness that happens in that moment as the memory consolidation might be coming back online as the propofol or whatever wears off, they're not going to have a moment of trauma of just having a breathing tube ripped out of their mouth. Because that's traumatic. How many people today have been like, hey, oh, I was in the last live. You guys, I guess uh, it was on uh, <laughs> a different platform, a live stream. They were saying, why did I remember the breathing tube coming out? Well, you know what? If you remember the trauma and shock of a breathing tube coming out, you're more likely to categorize that in a, as a traumatic experience that leads to PTSD than if it's one where you feel safe, comfortable, you trust what's going on. You know that you're in a safe environment and it comes out, give you the same force, the same discomfort coming out, but your brain will consolidate that memory completely differently. Um, Susan, Suman says, if I go to AFib due to my anxiety surgery, what do they do? <laughs> you know, anesthetics are a great way of breaking AFib, as are beta blockers, adenosine, et cetera, that we have in every anesthesia cart. So we take care of that. Um, hey, ballet babe, I appreciate the kind comments. Thank you. Reddit Pigeon says, why does propofol cause a burning when being injected? Uh, I'm sorry that you had that. I actually like to use lidocaine in conjunction with it. It really reduces the, the, um, that stinging sensation. It has to do with whatever it's emulsified in. Uh, lidocaine takes care of it for the vast majority of my patients. Uh, Lil American says, how to have a good conversation on chronic pain with your doctor? Any good prompts? Pain from an old injury. Lil American, great question. Like I told Chris earlier, um, I actually just filmed a video, hopefully it'll go up in the next week, about specifically how to ask about pain meds. Always demonstrate and come from curiosity. Doctor, what are the side effects of this? What are the pros or cons of what you're proposing? If, if they're recommending a medication, is it going to interfere with alcohol, with marijuana, with other medications that I take, over-the-counter drugs? Is this going to help me do what I want to do? Doctor, you know that I like to hike. You know hiking or whatever. Uh, um, can, uh, wow, I had a blank there. Kayaking. I was trying to say boating. That doesn't quite make sense. Kayaking. Whatever it is that you like to do. If your doctor knows what your goal is, and hopefully they have asked, and if they haven't asked, please be empowered to share what your goal is. How can they treat you if they don't know what your goal is? Doctor, how can I get back to doing that? Do you believe I can get back to doing that? If a doctor is saying, no, I don't think you can get back to doing that, prompt them on it. Be empowered to ask the hard question. Doctor, why do you? Or why don't you think I can do that? Let them answer. Put them in the hot seat. It's okay. It's our job. I like it when, not, when patients put me in the hot seat. I'm not afraid of it. If I was afraid of it, I wouldn't go into this field. No, I want to help patients. And if it means them feeling comfortable with me being uncomfortable as I really think about their case, go for it. That's what we're here for.
right? And that comes from a place of curiosity, not the intolerance of ambiguity, intolerance of uncertainty that we talked about. I hope that answers your question, little American. Um, steroid, uh, Brie brought, anyone get cervical steroid injections for stenosis pain, end up with myoclonus? Uh, it, it's rather rare. It has happened, but it's pretty rare. Um, yeah, it's called uh, usually a high spinal. Yeah. Thank you, Dore, prospective numeric. <laughs> um, and like Mandy Rice said, you are your best advocate. Speak your mind. Yes, Mandy, I would say in a respectful way, <laughs> but yes, you are your best advocate. Nobody will ever advocate better for yourself than you. Does anxiety cause sudden heat in the body? Uh, it can. It can, Ranbir. Other things can as well. I am devil woman. Good to see you. Last surgery I had, I was told not to take my Adderall. I don't know why. Well, Adderall can have some interactions with some anesthetics. Depends on what the surgery was. For most minor surgeries, I'm not concerned about it, but it's important for patients to tell me what they're taking. How do I feel about medical MJ, Jason? I have a whole bunch of videos on that. We'll talk about that on a, <laughs> on a different live stream. Uh, House of Hotness, thank you again for your kind comments. And we'll end with Jessica. Oh, hey, Mandy Rice from New Orleans, just subscribe. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mandy. Uh, Jessica says, I'm currently tapering off Oxy. I'm concerned that it may have caused cognitive harm in the form of worsened mental health. Do you know of any treatment approach to help the brain recover? Jessica, we don't have good ways for, quote, recovering the brain. But that's looking at external loci of control. The brain does, the brain can reduce its own BDNF, pardon, produce its own BDNF. Ketamine can help stimulate the production of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor. We believe it can help healing certain circuits in the brain. I don't want to sound too scientific about it because we really don't know. Don't let anyone fool you into thinking that we know how these chemicals work. But I wouldn't search for an external locus. I would focus on reducing the stress from the withdrawal process, the slow taper. Of course, you want to talk to your doctor about all of this. But unfortunately, in the Western biomedical model, we negate the body's ability to heal from psychological traumas or physical traumas that have now induced psychological traumas, whether they be tolerances, whether they be withdrawal complications, whether they be cognitive impairment like you're talking about. Uh, of course, normal blood sugars, reduced stress levels, etc., are also very important as well. Um, and by reduced sugar levels, I mean not having an elevated A1C. But there's a lot that goes into that question, but I don't want you to lose hope that these are permanent declines. Most often they're not. There are always exceptions. But do talk to your doctor and ask them if they believe, you know, is it once again bridge or destination? I'm sending you the best, Jessica. Thank you for your, honest, your vulnerability in sharing that. Um, Courtney, Kate, guys you, guys, you have so many great questions. I wish I could answer the rest of them. But um, I'll just end here with Ballet Babe saying, he wakes you up by slapping you. Um, Ballet Babe, I don't like to wake up patients by slapping them. I really have a trick. I won't share with you what it is today. I have one trick that every nurse I've ever worked with knows what I do. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll wait, wait, wait for one of you guys to guess what it is. No one will ever guess it. I have a much gentler way than slapping patients. Um, <laughs> but thank you all for your kind comments today. Pickles, I'm going to put my, my video, the actual you know, full-length one on how to talk with your doctors on. Hopefully in the next week you can watch it then. Uh, I wish everyone a uh, good rest of the day. And remember that you have more power over your health you've ever been told. If you did learn something, I'd appreciate it if you hit that like button and share what you've learned with others. Until next time.